One of my favourite scriptures is from 2 Timothy 3, 16. If it's not on the screen yet, do you know it already? No, too late. <laughs> so you can pretend like you've memorised it and you're going to quote it to me. Can you do that with me this morning to humour me? It says, all scripture is God-breathed or inspired by God and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the man and woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. So that's our theme for this year, is the Word and the Spirit. And it comes, well, this verse is one of the, a great illustration of that, how God's Word is God-breathed. And it's all of it, every single part of it is God-breathed. So we're going to be looking at a part of God's Word that's God-breathed this morning, and it's from Acts chapter 20. And uh, we, we'll get there in just a minute, uh, but if you could be looking it up, Acts chapter 20, verse 7 to 12. Now, through this year, um, in February, we saw that the Holy Spirit is our divine mentor, mentoring us in life as we spend time reading, uh, receiving, meditating, and applying God's Word to our life. In March and April, we focused on being grounded and growing in God's Word like a seed planted and watered, ready to spring to life. In May, we focused on advancing God's Word like a sword, you know, using it like a sword to advance, having the confidence of the Holy Spirit, like a pledge and a guarantee of salvation and authority um, for this life here on earth, but also for the next life. In June, we were speaking about sustaining, and God's Word isn't just maintaining, but it sustains, it grows, it expands, and uh, His kingdom of life uh, throughout the world. Uh, in July, uh, we stopped and examined different areas of life that stop, stop us from breaking through into that life that God has, is wanting us to break through in. And we looked at the symbols of like the hammer and rock and the anchor and things like that. But in this, um, this month, in August, we're focusing on living. Yeah. And God's Word is living and active. It is sharper than a two-edged sword. And I really... Every day we should be celebrating the abundant life that we've been given through Jesus, through his word and through his spirit. And um, the question is, are we lifting up people and refreshing others, speaking life into them? Or are we leaning on people, retarding them, or asleep to the opportunities that God has given us? Let's look into God's word. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people, and because he intended to leave the next day, he kept on talking until midnight. How much longer have I got to speak? <laughs> um, they, were, <laughs> there were many lamps in the upstairs room where they were meeting. Seated in a window was a young man called Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on and on. <laughs> When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and he was picked up dead. Paul went down, he threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said, he's alive, life is in him. Then he went upstairs and broke bread and ate. And after talking until daylight, he left. Sermon number two <laughs> it was just as long as sermon number one. Uh, the people took the young man home alive and they were all greatly comforted have you have you ever been sleepy at the wrong time and uh, made a miraculous mistake like you've been sleeping in church <laughs> anybody been guilty of that <laughs> i used to frown on people that did that but then i found myself doing it and, uh, <laughs> i was i don't know if i was frowning while i was sleeping or not <laughs> But um, have you ever been uh, entertaining visitors and you've fallen asleep while you've been talking to them? Is that, have that? <laughs> well, that's something my dad always does. And I thought, oh, Dad, you're so embarrassing. But now that I'm getting older, Julianne said, wake up, go get yourself a drink of water, wash your face, Phil. You know, she's trying to give me the signs because <laughs> she's so worried I'm going to fall asleep. Have you ever fallen asleep while you've been on the phone talking to someone? <laughs> I have. <laughs> Well, they were talking on and on and on, just like, yeah. And I sort of got a bit sleepy, and then I started to dream, you know, the conversation, and then I started speaking. And they said, what are you talking about? 
And I may try to make a miraculous mistake by coming up with some line, I can't remember, but I didn't actually admit that I was sleeping. <laughs> uh, have you been asleep, had a little nap at work? Sometimes put, just put your head down and uh, then find your photo of yourself on Facebook. <laughs> um, <laughs> have you been uh, asleep and driving in the car? Julianne drives our car most of the time. There's a special reason for that. <laughs> because I, I can be guilty of getting a little bit sleepy. And actually, one day I was driving uh, in the early days of the church. Uh, at the moment, we're blessed to be picking up... We have the opportunity to pick up bread and vegetables from all different places. We pick up from Aldi now, like a truckload, a lot of vegetables on a Tuesday. And we have opportunities on other days. So if you'd like to be part of that come and see me. But in the early days, we used to drive over to Acacia Ridge and I'd take my trailer there and I could order as many bags of veggies as I wanted. Now, some of those veggies were a bit um, borderline. <laughs> they weren't appreciated by everybody I dropped them off to. But uh, some people really did appreciate them. But anyway, I was on my way and I was feeling really sick this day. I had the flu. But I thought, no, I can't think of anyone else. I've just got to put the trailer on and go over there. And on the way over there, I'm slapping my face, trying to keep myself awake. And all of a sudden, Bang! And I wake up, and I'm in the middle of the road, driving down this Watson Road at, um, at Acacia Ridge. I'm in the middle of the road, and I said, what was that? And I thought I was asleep, and now I'm awake. I'm wide awake now. But what happened? What was the bang? And I'm looking through a vision mirror. What did I hit? You know, it could have been a child. It could have been a car. It could have been at someone's house. I don't know what I hit, but it was a bang. But I was miraculously, I was back on the middle of the road. I'd been woken up, and um, when I got there, I was just feeling the shake still, thanking God I was alive and I hadn't killed anyone. Anyway, I filled up the trailer and I was driving back. And as I was filling up the trailer, I noticed my hubcap was missing on my car and I thought, I must be where I hit the curb. So I went back to look for my hubcap and I found it there just lying on the side of the road. I thought, I wonder where I hit the curb and I couldn't find any tire mark. I looked all the way along there. There, mu there must be some tire mark where I banged the curb and bounced back out. And that's probably what happened. That's what my logic tells me. But I just couldn't find any evidence of it. And I thought, well, maybe it's a bit like this story where like a miracle happened where, uh, you know, I was woken up. I was woken up miraculously by an angel or something, just kicking my front wheel. <laughs> Wake up to yourself. <laughs> and, uh, and in God's mercy, I was back. Well, let's just go back to this story. Uh, it was at Troas and Paul had just been staying there for only seven days. It was his last day. And the people were meeting together uh, to break bread. And so they were there to fellowship and to worship and to receive from Jesus. They were hungry for the word and the spirit. And, and the people loved Paul and wanted to make the, last of the most hour, the last, make the most of the last hours with him. And uh, there were many lamps in the room, we're told. And the lamps like lighting up the darkness so that to facilitate the word just continuing to flow. Hearts were being filled with God's Word and with the Holy Spirit. But Eutychus, who was a young man, is there any youth here that get sleepy sometimes? <laughs> Sit on the fringes. <laughs> he was a young man, and uh, actually the name means lucky. So you mentioned before, um, uh, you mentioned before, Bruce, you said, I don't know if it was fortunate. That's what the actual word means, fortunate. I don't know if it was fortunate or not fortunate. It's a bit like Eutychus. Was it fortunate that he fall, fell asleep? So he could be woken up at a great miracle? Or was it unfortunate that he fell asleep and he took the big, <laughs> big dive? But uh, I don't, you like the word fortune, I like to use the word blessed. Because fortune people, or luck people think is random, but we know that every good gift comes from God. So he was blessed with the name Eutychus, and um, God, uh, God blesses things, even things that look bad, he can turn them around to be a blessing. He was sitting in, at, in the window... Uh, he was not filling up with God's word anymore. He was like me on that phone conversation. <laughs> you know, um, He fell into a sleep and he was drifting off. Um, and as he was sleeping, it wasn't a very safe place to sleep, sitting in a window. I think there's a story of a guy that was planking on the side, on that ledge outside of those, some of those motel rooms. He was planking out there and fell asleep and rolled over. And um, he wasn't as lucky or fortunate or blessed, as Eutychus was this day. Um, and he fell three stories, Eutychus, and it says that he was picked up dead. Now, the uh, Bible scholars say, well, maybe he wasn't, you know, there's a bit of a dispute about this story, about whether he was actually dead or whether he just appeared to be dead. 
But either way, an amazing story, amazing miracle happened this day. So um, the people would have been thinking, hey, the Word and the Spirit, you know, this is supposed to be a, a time where we're with God. It's, you know, Jesus' Word and His Spirit is supposed to bring life. But for Eutychus, it seemed like the opposite was happening. He should have been full of life, but now it was appearing he was dead. The people uh, would have been thinking, how could this be? You know, they would have been alarmed, they would have been confused, angry, disappointed, fearful. Uh, but what was God's response to all of this? Well, we can see his response through the heart of Paul. The first thing is, Paul stopped speaking. And people are saying, yes, after six hours of listening, that's a good thing. <laughs> you know, no, they weren't thinking that. But he did stop speaking. He quickly went to the youth. You know, he ran down the stairs and he quickly went to the youth and he didn't just say, are you all right? He sort of threw himself. I'd, I'd love to have been there to see what actually happened, but he just threw himself on top. Have you, have you ever done that to wake your kids up in the morning? Just, uh, it works, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he threw himself on top of him and, uh, and then uh, he said these words, don't be alarmed. He's alive, life is in him. And he was miraculously revived, this Eutychus. They all went up back upstairs and had a second service, which went until morning. So I was thinking a bit like, feeling a bit like Paul today because I got to speak twice. So service number one, I spoke too long. <laughs> I've, got till mid, I've got till daybreak now, so that's good. <laughs> so uh, what are the common factors in these meetings, these two different church services that happen? Uh, both ser services have said that they met to break bread, to remember Jesus, to fellowship. Uh, the people were filled, being filled with God's Word and the Holy Spirit in both services. Both services, they wanted to hear Paul one last time before he left for Troas. Uh, and at both services, Paul spoke long. It looks like he spoke, spoke at, at least five or six hours in each meeting. And uh, because of this urgency to get as much from Paul before he left. But both meetings ended in slightly different ways. The first meeting ended with, um, yeah, very sad meeting, a very sad ending to the meeting. Imagine if you think, oh, this was a dud meeting, this one. Oh, mate, I thought I came to get some life. Somebody's died. And then you decide to go home. You didn't wait for Paul to rush down the stairs. You sort of just snuck out, okay, this is my opportunity. I have been waiting to get out of this place. You slip out the side door, you go home and think, oh, I'm not going back there. Uh, that, could have been, that could have been the story for some, who knows. But um, that was the ending of the first meeting. There was, uh, there was death, there was alarm, there was chaos, and it looked like, you know, it wasn't a happy ending for Paul's visit. But at the end of the second meeting, Eutychus is alive. And it's specifically mentioned in the last line there, and it says the people were greatly comforted. This time, things were different. In the meeting, though, when you think about it, I don't think Eutychus sat in the window for the second meeting. Not a good place to sit. <laughs> he did not fall asleep. A bit like me driving home. I did not fall asleep on the way home. <laughs> and the meeting ended with Eutychus returning home alive and refreshed. And everybody was refreshed. Everyone was more feeling more alive than they were earlier on. Just for the remainder of the time that I'd like to speak with this morning, I just have three points that I'd like you to remember. And uh, the, what are some life lessons from this story that will, can, could give life to us? The first one is um, you know, life, that stuff happens, but God can use it for good. You know, sometimes when we're listening to this story, we can think, oh, it's Paul's fault because he just spoke too long. Or it's Eutychus's fault. He shouldn't have been sitting in the window. Those youths, they're always mucking up, you know. <laughs> the... Uh, don't worry, I used to be one. I used to be the youth pastor and they always come and go, Phil, what are you doing? Control the youth. They're all out of, out of control. Tess doesn't have any of those problems. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> but um, stuff does happen. And, uh, and Jesus says it himself in Matthew 5, 44. He says, I tell you, love your enemies and pray for anyone who mistreats you. You know, there are going to be those bad days where you feel mistreated. But just keep loving those people. And then you'll be acting like your Father in heaven. He makes the sun rise on both the good and the bad people. Like you have the good days and the bad days. doesn't matter how good or bad you are. You're going to get the, the sun rising and you're going to get the rain. For, uh, it falls on the ones who do right and for the ones that do wrong. But if we only act the right way, if we only love the people that are loving us, what reward will we get? Even the tax collectors 
can love their friends. And uh, Galatians 6, 9 says, Don't be weary in doing good. At the proper time, you'll reap a harvest if you don't give up. For those people who went home early, missed the, missed the in-between meeting and the second meeting, they really did miss out on something. Uh, why did Eutychus fall out of the window? Was it really because Paul preached too long? Was it really because he shouldn't have been speaking in the window? Well, the, nobody commentates on that. Jesus doesn't make any comment. Um, uh, well, Paul, the writer, Luke, doesn't make any comment. Got the right person eventually. He doesn't make any comment on, uh, on the reason, or, you know, anyone being at fault. And sometimes we can overanalyze things and think, oh, somebody must be at fault for this. You know, we can be overthinking things. But really, sometimes stuff happens and it's not for us to really know. Um, I know in uh, Luke 13, it says, you know, there's been a lot of disasters happening around the world. Why does this happen? You know, and we try to work out who was at fault. But um, uh, in the book of Luke, chapter 13, it says, you know, when the tower fell on those people, you know, who was to blame? You know, were they really bad sinners? And Jesus said, no, but you can learn something from it. Stop sinning. And uh, those people that were persecuted and murdered when they were offering their sacrifices, you know, um, we've heard stories like that, you know, Christians that have been murdered in, in our own day. Um, you know, who can we blame for this? They must have been doing something wrong. But J- Jesus says, no, no, we can learn from it. And Romans 8, 28 says, God works everything for the, those who are for, out for the good, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So stuff does happen. You know, who of you have broken a bone in your body? <laughs> I have. I was helping people. I was helping somebody move house. Ralph and I were helping. We would got to the end. We just had one last trampoline to load on. We loaded it on. All we had to do was drop it off. I dropped it, jumped off the back of the truck and there was this divot in the ground and my, there was this loud crack and my ankle just turned sideways. And I thought, ah, that hurt. And I'm just lying there in agony. I wasn't taking it nice and uh, quietly. <laughs> and Ralph was alarmed. You're right, Bill. And I said, no, I'm not all right. So I never got to do that last delivery. It was only just about 100 metres from where I lived. So he dropped me off at home. And uh, I was in agony. And uh, Julianne said, oh, well, you should be able to get yourself. It's your left ankle. So you should be able to get yourself to the doctor, all right? Because <laughs> <laughs> it was an automatic car, of course. <laughs> automatic. <laughs> So the only place open is that Turinga Medical Centre, which is, has that, that steep hill back in those days. <laughs> so it's hoppy up the hill. <laughs> and I waited for ages. Finally, they said, oh, no, you'll have to go to the uh, Ipswich Hospital. <laughs> oh. And then you're, uh, and then you're waiting there. You know how short a wait that is. <laughs> you know, there's two temptations. <laughs> this is so frustrating. Oh, oh I wonder how you're going to turn this around for good. It must be, it must be something good. So, so as I'm as I'm trying to hop up the hill to the Ipswich Hospital, which is also on a nice flat um, terrain, just like that. <laughs> there must be something good. You must have a good plan here. And as I'm waiting around in the fascia clinic for about three hours, watching everybody get put in front of me, oh, there's something good you've got planned. What is it? And I was honestly trying to find out what it was. And then I actually did get to share with some people. And it was like, yeah, God, you work out everything for good. This is actually good. You know, you're going to work out something good out of this. And that's what we can learn from this story with Eutychus. You know, God did work it out for good. Yeah. Stuff does happen. But we just have to keep holding on and not to give up believing that and, put, and keeping ourselves in that position to receive that good happening, happening for us. The second thing from I learned from this uh, story is we need to watch where we're sitting. It's not good to sit in a window. There are windows here. Who's sitting right next to that window there? Watch out. <laughs> it's a little bit safer here because you can't actually open any of the windows. Um, but um, we were, uh, the men we were listening to Robbie Zonderigger a few years ago at a men's breakfast, and I never forgot, well, I did because I forget lots of things, but I wrote it down, and I keep going back to it to remind myself. But uh, there's um, five, times, five areas where men are at risk, and I think this applies to ladies and everyone, really, uh, in our lives. In sort of, we're at risk of slipping you know, onto the fringe and then a little bit further, and before you know it, we're doing the wrong thing. He was speaking in relation to pornography and uh, how men have this tendency to go 
Um, you know, when they're feeling uncomfortable, when they're feeling um, bored or lonely or anxious or stressed or tired, when they're feeling the blast, I don't know if that's on the screen. I think there's, it's on, yeah. The, um, when they're feeling this, men in their brains perceive it as discomfort discomfort we don't like being bored we don't like being lonely we don't like being anxious stressed or tired so in a something breaks down in our minds where we look to go to a pleasure center and for men a, a lot of them associate with viewing images like that as something pleasurable so that becomes a habit and and men uh, are most at risk when they're in one of these five boats and uh, so th that we need if we are aware of it then we can be careful to guard ourselves so that we don't go down that alley and I just thought of uh, that as an illustration when I was thinking about Eutychus because he was sitting on the fringe. You know, some people think, how close can I walk to the edge of the cliff without falling off so that I don't do the wrong thing by God? But if we're just thinking about Jesus, we're not really thinking about the edge of the cliff. We're thinking about just being right in the center where Jesus was. And I actually do that because of that uh, family trait of, you know, at the, at the conference on the weekend, I thought, I know where I'm going to sit because last conference I sat on those nice comfy chairs up the back and I was sort of all trying to keep myself awake the whole time. This time I'm going to sit on those nice comfy plastic chairs right up the front and I'll be right engaged on the edge of my seat, ready to take down everything that God wants to show me. And I had such a better time. But it actually talks about how we sit in the Bible. In Psalm 1 it says, Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the counsel of the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in the seat of mockers, but instead his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates both day and night, and he is like a tree planted by streams of water. Trees planted by streams of water are living, right? They live, they're big, they're massive. They yield their fruit in season, their leaf does not wither. And so we need to think about where we're sitting. Well done, you guys sitting on the front row. <laughs> I haven't seen Murray yawn or blink anything. <laughs> so it's good to be position ourselves. Where are we sitting? How are we sitting? And, uh, you know, are we bringing our Bibles to church? Have we got our notepad? Or John pretends to be taking notes on his iPhone when we know he's really texting. But, uh, <laughs> you know, how... Sorry, John. LAUGHTER <laughs> So uh, how are we sitting? Are we sitting expectantly ready to receive or are we sitting on the fringe, you know, out, out there sort of we're there but we're sort of not quite all the way there. And I'm not saying that's what Eutychus was doing but it could be what we're doing. And uh, it's something to watch out for because if we're sitting on the fringe, we're a lot more at risk than if we're sitting right up close to where, where Jesus is. So um, when in, this, uh, in this series, we're talking about like fresh air and fresh breath and living and there is this book, uh, I can't really go through it uh, with you this morning, but um, I was reading this with the, we were reading as a staff last year, and uh, Chris Hodges got some information uh, from one of the largest census of uh, church people that was ever done back in the year of 1999. And um, in this census, they discovered the churches that were alive and life-giving, the ones that were growing and empowering and people felt um, like they were alive, he found eight common factors in those, and they're on the screen here. The, um, just back the one before, I think, Christian. Yep. Um, you know, in those churches, there was empowering leadership. There was gift-orientated ministry. It was great to see the people on the team uh, to Mozambique using their gifts. Um, passionate spirituality, functional structures, inspiring worship services. Thank you, worship team, for an inspirational worship time this morning. There was holistic multiplying small groups. So there was a lot of people were meeting in relational groups. There was deed-orientated evangelism and there was loving relationships. And uh, he really, uh, Chris Hodges, who wrote this book, really studied those things and then he thought, well, what does a life-giving person look like? That's a life-giving church. What does a life-giving person look like? And then he came up for his church with something he calls the Magnificent Seven. He said if people have these seven qualities in their lives, they're going to be lifting not leaning they're going to be giving life to people refreshing people not uh wearing not uh wearing them down and uh he said the, these are the common factors um enjoy god and serve out of a delight and not duty and um every time i come to this campus i see a lot of people that do that uh, mike and chrissy are probably the ones because they're usually part of the worship team but 
They uh, are inspirational people that I meet here. And I, I, they're nearly neighbours of mine, but you always see them doing that. Um, not because they have to, because they want to. Um, the second one is embra- embracing their uniqueness and calling. Uh, know and like who God has called them to be. When I uh, think of that, I think of Tess. I think of you, Tess, that that's what you're like. And Nick, embracing the, he's a very unique man, Nick. <laughs> and uh, he's embracing his calling, you know, step by step. And many people are here are doing that. Feeling that they are empowered to be creative, to pursue their dreams. And um, I was thinking, yeah, that was what was happening on that Mozambique team. All those different ones using their gifts to bless others. Having a sense of purpose and focus that they're living out. And uh, that's definitely what John and Deb are doing uh, in this campus aren't they they've got a strong sense of purpose and there's many others like that that have joined in that purpose of multiplying god's kingdom laughing often now i was trying to find that one in the uh in those eight qualities of growing churches the laughing often but um i couldn't find it there but he put it in there because it is a it's in his ingredient you know mary heart does good like a medicine it gives life and so maury you always catch maury laughing i saw karen in the shopping center yesterday, she's just got a big smile on her face, enjoying life, bubbling over. And Joycelyn, I know a little, like all of us have our struggles in our life, but um, every time I'm talking with Joycelyn, she's always smiling and laughing. Where is she hiding? She's, she left at the end of the first meeting today. <laughs> <laughs> well, the kids are having their own fun meeting down there with Paul. Hey, it might be, I wonder what's happening they're not sitting near the window over there (laughs) yeah so um cultivating healthy relationships and uh you know i see people like sue and eddie always doing that always reaching out to the new people and trying to build them in and uh, i know there's many others that do that too so please don't feel like you've been left out because god sees it all and it's all life-giving and focused on serving others and um that's what i see bruce and margaret uh, do and they go on all these weird and wonderful trips because they're interested in just serving and loving people, and then it rubs off. It gives life. It breathes life wherever they go. And that's how God wants us to be. And, you know, we're talking about Father's Day. This Ben Naitoko guy, you read down that list, and you think, that's him. It's a description of him. So, hey, if you want someone to get a bit of life, you know, they're already rubbing it off you, uh, but they're gonna ru- a lot of it's going to get rubbed off Ben, because that's what he's like. So you won't be disappointed if you bring people to rub up against him on that Father's Day service. My last point is we need to run to the weary with words of life. And uh, when you think about Paul, what did he do? He didn't keep on droning on. You know, this message is getting a bit long, Phil. It's time to go, I know. But stop. He listened. He looked at the people that were the person that was at risk. He probably should have stopped before he fell out of the window, but never mind. (laughs) But he ran to him. You know, he threw himself on him. And then he shouted out, Don't be alarmed. He's alive. Life is in him. And really, when he was saying that, he wasn't saying that to the man that was dead, was he? He was saying it to everyone. He was giving out the life. He was running to the man, but he was also interested in all the others that were so alarmed. He says, don't worry, be happy, it's okay. He's alive. And uh, Paul really did believe that Jesus is alive and he gives life. Paul did say, Jesus is alive in him. This guy is going to rise up to give life. Paul really did uh, take some provocative action. And then he spoke the words of life to everyone. So the young man was the beneficiary, but so was everybody else in advance of what Uh, in in advance of the miracle that just happened um paul uh, jesus when he was preaching and there was someone that had died they said uh, you know don't worry jesus anymore like don't worry him because it's too late the man's the the girl's already dead and jesus said to the father don't be alarmed don't be afraid just believe just put your trust in me just put your trust in jesus and um or maybe the angels when I was driving the car that day because I don't think anyone else saw me. They're, they're alarmed. Something's happening. Phil's crashing. And God says, don't be alarmed. Just leave this one to me. Bang! You know, he kicks the side. <laughs> <laughs> but um, isn't God good? His first reaction is, you naughty little boy, what are you doing sitting in that window? You deserve to be dead, you know? He doesn't go on like that. 
hey, you guys, you should have been watching out for this guy. You shouldn't have let him sit there. He, Paul didn't say that, and the crowd, you know, he, he wasn't saying, oh, I shouldn't have droned on so long this mo- tonight. I shouldn't have spoke so long. You know, Paul wasn't thinking any of those things. He was just thinking of um, taking some action. You know, he was thinking of running to the weary to give them words of life. My favourite verse has always been Philippians 4.13. Does anyone know that one? I can do things through Christ who strengthens me. And it's great with a can of Coke as well. You shake it. (laughs) If you know me, if you've been hanging around me, you know that. (laughs) Um, But recently I thought, I don't want that as my favourite verse anymore because there's another verse which isn't just about I can do all things through Christ. Christ who strengthens me. It's about, hey, everybody else can as well. 2 Timothy 2 verse 2. It says, the things that you've heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, you're to go out and entrust them to reliable men who'll then be qualified to teach others. It's all meant to multiply. So we're reading this story about Paul, but it's not really about Paul and Eutychus. It's about the life that's in Eutychus. And what's Eutychus going to go and do with that life that he's been given? And he's going to go and trust it. The people that were watching think, wow, don't be afraid. Life is in him. What's the message? Don't be afraid. Just believe. Who can I go and pass that message uh, message on to? And that's really what it is all about. And that's um, what I always thought, um, you know, I've been so impacted by Philippians 4.13 in my life, not thinking I could do anything, thinking that I was useless and uh, hopeless and I was so shy and I was lazy. You know, I I didn't really think I'd ever do anything in life. And I've been impacted by that saying, hey, it's not true. God can do anything. He can breathe life. He can pump some life into me. So, uh, but it's not, that's not where God wants me to stop. He wants me to believe that I can pump that life into others who will then go and pump life into others and to others. And it's not me doing it, it's the Holy Spirit. And that's where the real breath of life comes from because that is what the Holy Spirit is all about. So in conclusion, I, if the musicians could come, I'd just like to ask a question this morning of you. Maybe stuff's happening in your life and you're feeling like, hey, they told me it was life, but it's death. You know, it's only the end of the first meeting, though. The something going to be happening, and the second meeting's about to start. So um, maybe you've been thinking that this morning. Please don't stay in that place. Don't be weary. Don't let yourself be weary in the, in the believing for good and doing good. Because at the proper time, there will be a wonderful party. There'll be a harvest if you don't give up. So I know there's lots of things happening in, in all of our lives, but please don't adopt like the devil's voice he's trying to sow that message of defeat but jesus is sowing that message of life don't be afraid just believe don't be alarmed there's life yet to come it's true this morning you might be uh, sitting in one of those at risk situations you know you're sitting in the window and you're getting a bit sleepy i'm looking around to see any of you sleeping no (laughs) the uh the yeah you don't stay there we want to run You know, those of us, you know, that fathers and mothers heart want to run to you and want to lift you up. We want to encourage you. Um, We might not have realized that you're in that position yet, but we we want to do that. But you can take that initiative too by moving into the center like Eutychus did when he came back. I'm sure he didn't sit in that place again next to the window. Or maybe you know people that are sitting in those at-risk situations. You know, we this morning can be empowered to be like Paul and to run to them. We might have to do something radical like fly through the air and jump on top of them. I don't know, but we can do something. In James 5, is, James is the book of action in the Bible. If you want to read about action, read the book of James. But the very last verse says, if we can turn a sinner from the error of their ways, we have saved a life from death. We've given life to someone who looked like they were heading for death. And there's no greater thrill than that. So I'd say throw yourself through the air this week. Is there someone on that list, um, John mentioned, can you invite one person that might be you're throwing yourself through the air so that they can hear the words of life? Maybe God's given you the word of life to speak, speak to them. So I just encourage you, you know, we can just merely listen to the word. But James 1.22 said, don't merely listen. You're deceiving yourself. Do what it says. That's what God really wants us to do this morning.